Alrighty y'all, today I'm gonna to be giving you seven mistakes to avoid when converting your shed into a house. Let's do it. My name is Bo Brotherton with Better Together Life and I also created the Shed to House Facebook group. So I have seen a lot since about the beginning of 2017 and people have been converting these sheds into houses for many, many years, but really the movement has really caught on in, in 2017. And since then, I've seen a whole lot of mistakes that people have made and I have made myself with converting one of these buildings into a house. So let's get right into it. We're gonna do this David Letterman style. Number seven is gonna be foundation. Something that I made that mistake. I will say that out loud that I think that I made a mistake with my foundation. I think we did a decent job with having this, this crushed rock bed and then the cinder block piers on top. If I had to do it again, I believe that I would have taken the time and not been in such of a hurry and done true pier and beam foundation where you get the cinders where you get those uh, cardboard cylinders and you auger down about two or three feet and you put that in you pour concrete in there so that you have something solid to the earth it's not going to be bad it's going to what we have is the rock foundation i would say that that's going to be minimum something that you want to do i would not suggest just putting it straight onto the blocks onto the dirt if i had to do it over again i definitely would have done a real pier and beam foundation Number six, the next mistake that we had a little bit of experience with is we did not know that once we got our building here, this is a shed. It's made by shed building companies. We're happy with ours, but there was some things that we needed some extra caulk around the windows and the door frames. One thing of how most of these buildings are designed, especially the barn style buildings, is there's not a lot of eaves that come out. So the where the where the building comes, the, that wall is really, really close to it, as opposed to a normal house where you see the eaves that come out to where here's the wall. So the rain would come and just come down. So on these barn style buildings, it's really, really close up there. So the water wants to hit and it just wants to run all the way down the wall. Water will find cracks and crevices anywhere. And that's something that can happen. So you want to seal this place up with all the windows. And then once you start bringing all of like your mini splits in and your electric and all that, they're gonna be drilling holes everywhere. You wanna come back and you wanna seal all of those holes up. Preferably with spray foam, sometimes it's better to do caulk or silicone. So you wanna seal any crack that comes in, any window, and make sure that your doors are sealed as well. All right, number five, moisture control. Guys, oh my goodness, moisture control is really, really big in these buildings. For us, we have six people living in this house. We came from a typical 2,000 square foot suburban house. And with that, we still had two bathrooms. We still had one kitchen. We still had four kids that needed to take baths every day. That we still needed all the cooking. So you might think that it doesn't matter, but that this is, this is where it comes into play you have all of the same moisture that you're creating because of cooking and bathing and the humidity itself and air conditioning and all that, but it's all in a tighter space. So you really need to think about moisture control because you guys, you do not, you do not want to mess with mold. You don't want to mess with mold. This is, it, mold is a nasty thing. We came from Houston where mold was so bad, it is still kind of bad after Hurricane Harvey. You want to really be planning on moisture control, especially if you're in a humid climate. You wanna have vents in your bathrooms so that anytime you take a shower, you have a vent that comes through. We have green building technologies, that's where we got ours. It's specifically made for small spaces. It, it, it's, it's very low profile, fits right up into a two by four. You wanna be able to get that moisture out. Also, I highly suggest vent hoods for the kitchen. We need to get ourselves our vent hood. We did the wiring for a vent hood, but we just haven't purchased a kitchen vent hood yet. So that's a mistake that we're doing right now. But the next thing to do is you really need to have at least one, I would say uh, hopefully two dehumidifiers. And you just wanna be running those things constant. Uh, you want to be able to make sure that you get all of the moisture out of your house. You really want in there, you know, 
35, 45% humidity inside the house because what these things don't have is they don't have attic space. Typically in a normal house with an attic space, you can allow the attic to breathe and so any kind of moisture, any kind of humidity can get, it kind of likes that attic space and it can vent out. So you want proper ventilation. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about that with my top, my number one mistake that people make. But that is something that without having a proper attic space, you really want to do your best and keep control of the moisture. So have dehumidifier fires, have fans, you wanna be able to get proper ventilation. Alrighty, number four is going to be dead wood. Some people call it dead wood or blocking or some people say backing. It is so boring. It is completely boring and expensive because you're just literally wasting wood to nail up into your house that you'll never see and it'll never have any kind of benefit except for the benefit. Stop hitting the camera, Finley. Deadwood is something, I even made a whole video on it whenever we did it, I'll put the link right up here. Deadwood, either your sheetrock or your ceiling or your shiplap, something they, whenever you have the studs, they can, they can screw into that or nail into any kind of studs. You understand what that is. But it's a lot of people get confused about the backing is sometimes there's a corner but there's not a, na a place to nail, it's a, a, you need a nailer there. So if they put up the sheetrock on a corner and you have a stud here, but you don't have a stud right here, then you can't get to that spot. A lot of it is we had it in our ceiling. So you need to really take that serious, take your time, don't be in a hurry. I would suggest trying to get as much of your blocking done before you run your plumbing and your electric, because then you don't have to like make weird cuts and go around your electric. Deadwood is how we were able to do our vault cathedral type ceiling. It's not really a cathedral ceiling, but how we were able to do our shiplap ceiling with the exposed beams. Just dawned on me that it's pretty easy to be able to wrap the beam with deadwood so that then we could run shiplap and nail it in between both of those beams. Figure out the design you want, know that, and be able just to take your time and know that you're probably gonna miss some deadwood. You can never have too much deadwood. All right, we only have three more, stick with me. Here we go. So number three is gonna be, guys, don't get in over your head. I got in over my head with several things, but then I was able to make the quick decision of nope, I do not wanna be a home builder. I want to live here on my property and I want a homestead. Since we started the Shed to House group, I've seen a lot, a lot of people that try to do this, they get in over their head and then they don't know what to do. And they've wasted a lot of money and they have a dangerous home. So my suggestion that if you've never done these things before, especially if you have kids or if you're in some sort of a time, time crunch, you need a place to live. I highly, highly suggest that you hire professional contractors for your rough plumbing and your rough electrical. Those things, rough plumbing, rough electric, Rough plumbing and your rough electric. Yeah. Those yeah. things, you um, it's just so worth it to be able to do that. Like the drains in plumbing. You do not want to do your drains and be having septic come up into your house. So you want licensed plumber, licensed electric. You don't want to burn your house down with bad electrical. Unless you have years to do this. If you have a year or two years better, Trust me, there are so many things. If you've never done this before and you just want time freedom, you want to be mortgage free, there's lots and lots of skills to still learn with doing this. If you're nervous about it, hire out your rough electrical and rough plumbing. Get that done and then work on your skills after that. Number two is gonna be budget at least, minimal 20% increase of your expenses. Again, unless you do this, unless you are a contractor that knows what you're doing, you know how much stuff is gonna cost, minimal 20% additional. Meaning that if you make a budget and then put everything out of all the things that you think you're gonna have to spend money on, then do another line item in that Excel spreadsheet for what it's going to increase. What you think, that 20%, so you'll add all those things up into Excel, 
And then the last line item is gonna be, you're gonna take all that, you're gonna times that total by 20%, and you're, that's gonna be an increase. I only did 10% and it was way low. I would say 20 to 25% is probably what you wanna be able to put in there for increase. That lets you know a little bit before, because it's like a Dave Ramsey. You wanna spend your money on paper before you actually spend it. You don't wanna be done like we were, and then like, oh my, how did we spend $30,000 in two months? And we even spent more than that. So that's one thing for your budget, so to let you know how much this is costing us, I'm gonna put a link down below right up here so that you can go and get our income expense report so that you can see how much this house is costing us. All right guys, here is the number one mistake that you need to avoid when converting a shed to a house. You ready for it? It's not gonna be all that exciting. And for some reason I see this over and over again in the shed to house group. People always say, I wish I would have done spray foam. I wish I would have done more insulation in my house. Guys, listen, this is a wooden box that is made for a shed to store things in. It's just recently that people started doing this for houses and cabins. Whenever we did the spray foam, the spray foam found cracks everywhere. And it doesn't matter what company you do, they're not going to completely seal this place up. They're not gonna do a house wrap around the ceiling of your house. They will do it around the sides and that's what they did for ours. But there was crack, there was spray foam coming up all up the, where the wall met the roof. So you want to seal this thing up perfectly. Don't skimp out do spray foam insulation. On the interior of the house, we did open cell spray foam, and then we did closed cell spray foam underneath. That's something that I'm not necessarily an expert in is between open cell and closed cell. If you know, put it down in the comments below of what you think is better for open cell and closed cell spray foam. I'll leave that up to you guys down in the comments to give me your thoughts between closed cell, open cell spray foam. I hired a contractor to do it and he explained it and it made sense and that's why we went with open cell and then we went with closed cell underneath. One also thing about this and I'll tie it back to moisture control. Again, I'm not an expert on this, but this is what everybody told me. When you are doing spray foam in one of these buildings, you do not need to install ridge vents in the ceiling, the interior ceiling, because there's not an attic. So you need to, if you don't have, if you are not doing spray foam, then you have to install ridge vents. Otherwise you can get moisture buildup up in the roof and the ceiling in between the roof and the uh, insulation where moisture builds up there, it can't get out. And then that's where you get mold. But to my knowledge, all the research that I did, speaking to several people, what they said is when you do spray foam, you create a perfect seal of the home. So there's not the moisture going in and out. So it doesn't need to breathe like that. That's what everybody said is doing spray foam. So that allows you to have the full use of your ceiling. You don't have to close things off to have a little attic space. That's why you do spray foam. And again, I'm not an expert on that. The main thing is I see it so often in the group is people going back and saying, ah, oh, I wish I would have done spray foam. Moisture control, but also for heat and AC. It lowers your electric bill. Spray foam, please don't make the mistake. The only reason why I would say that you would not do spray foam in one of these buildings is budget. And I don't understand that. I really don't. It's kind of like Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey says the absolute worst time to use a credit card is in emergencies. That's what people do is they say, I'm just keeping that credit card just in case an emergency, just in case something happens, a crisis, and I need that. And what Dave's response is, the absolute worst time to use a credit card is in an emergency, is in a crisis. You don't have money, you just lost a job, and then you wanna go into debt? That's just ridiculous, that makes no sense. It makes no sense of why you would do that. And that's with spray foam. If you don't have the budget to do spray foam, then that means that you definitely don't have the budget to pay higher electric bills 
for years to come to have to use more wood if you're doing a wood stove for years to come to have to do your house twice because you get mold buildup for years to come and one thing that i'll add is most people that are converting shed the houses they want to put it in a rural area they want a farm they want a homestead a lot of this they just want to be out of the way because there's no building codes guess what is in rural areas guys critters there's so many critters here there's bugs and there's rats and there's scorpions there's everything that wants to get into your comfy cozy house if you just do normal insulation or especially if you try to do you know wool insulation or something like that that is a perfect home for them they're going to get up the rats and the mice are going to get up there they're going to make their nests in there it's going to be the best you're going to have so many critters living in your walls and again i know that a lot of people are going to say don't do spray foam that's to toxic and it's bad for you guys and gals hey i get it you can put that down in the comments but you're going to say that that spray foam is toxic and then you're going to be on your phone all day and then you're going to go eat mcdonald's and drink starbucks coffee and nasty stuff and be stressed out in a nine to five job spray foam insulation all right that is it those are my top seven mistakes to avoid when converting a shed to a house let me know what you thought about these seven mistakes down in the comments let me know if i missed something also if you like this video please give us a thumbs up and subscribe that helps and please share this i know that there's a lot of other groups than the shed to house facebook group so share it on facebook and twitter uh, if you think that this would be helpful because hey sharing you know it's mean not to share so, so share this video with people that you think it could be beneficial for. Because remember, we're only better together because you guys are here. So please comment down below and share and like, because we need y'all here in the community. All right, guys. See y'all in the next one. Bye.